All right, thank you for attending Worldwide Slot Car Chat on Zoom. This is our 52nd show, however, not the one year anniversary. That's next week being the first show that we did a year ago. Uh, so we'll do the same thing we always do next week, just like we're gonna do this week. That's chat about slot car. Uh, we do have, let's see, is he on yet? No. Uh, Nick Kurzweil had some things that he wanted to add to the Area 71 car modeling discussion, uh, but it doesn't look like he's on just yet or I'm not seeing him in the list. Uh, when he comes on, we'll talk about that. Uh, for now, does anybody have any show and tell they wanna share? Go ahead, Martin. Right. Um, forgive me while I try and share my screen, but uh, okay, is that enabled now? No. Let me make sure it's on. Yeah, hold no, on. Now it says disabled. Yeah, go ahead and try again. Okay, so Saturday morning, I uh, I missed the postman as I usually do. Is this showing? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's Saturday morning. Mr. Uh, Mr. Postman, as I usually do, and I managed to chase him and catch him because I had a fairly good idea what was in there. Um, I had some bits for this car turn up. This is a, a Mr. Slot car. Uh, if I get that out of the way, you can see what I'm doing. I received this. Come on, it become okay. Be on the wrong screen. Thank you. I received this. I got a chassis. Uh, it's got all the washers. It's got all the neoprene washers for suspension, and it's set up beautifully. So uh, it's even got the little lead pipes there for me to push my guide wires through. So I, I set that up, and I give it a go on my poly, uh, my poly car track. And even though it was set up for wood, it ran really well. It took the tiniest bit of adjustment here and here. But this sort of uh, goes back to what Chris was saying about having a fore and aft pivot. So, you know, the suspension is pivoting around this point here and this point here. And what a difference that made. It, it really ran beautifully and, and such a difference to the stock car. So I was really, really impressed with running that thing. So uh, I must thank Chris when he comes along for his very kind parcel he sent me. He's there. So is he? Oh, hey, Chris. I, I couldn't see you on the list. I, I was going to say, Martin, it looks like his handiwork. It's these, look at these. Oh boy, they drive me mad, those things. They're fantastic, aren't they? So I ran it without wet, uh, without um, any any weight in it because it was just going around the, the track in the garage, only had a small track and it, and it really handled so well. So I just kept playing with these things to see what it would do. And uh, yeah, some fantastic adjustment in, you know, eighth of a turn at a time. It really is a revelation. I'm not particularly a great, a great fan of Group C type cars in line, but uh, this was... A real revelation compared to what it was when I tried to run it, you know, a few years back when I bought it. So, yeah, really, really impressed. And many thanks, Chris. Oh, you're very welcome. And Martin, that's still on its stock tires, right? Uh, yeah, I've, I put the stock tires on for the photo because I, I just wanted those oh. rims on it. Yeah, oh. I, I did have some, uh, I think what I had in it. I think I might have had super grips on it. Oh, okay. Yeah, super grips. So, yeah, yeah I'll throw the bits. Uh, thank you very much. And it's, it's really helped this sort of come together now, what you guys have been telling me over the weeks. And it all came together and, and worked perfectly. So. so, so what all did you actually get in the mail? What came in the package? The chassis and the pod, and everything screwed together, ready to go. So, I just dropped my motor in, okay. dropped my axles in. Uh, yeah, dropped my guide and the guide wires in. So, it, it, it was the, the chassis, the pod and all the screws, and the washers. So, uh, yeah, interesting how you glued the washers in, too. So, Chris, one question. What glue do you use for putting these guys on? Uh, just uh, like a, a styrene weld, weld pro weld or something like that. Just a yeah, styrene so binder. It's, it's really neat job. I couldn't see any uh, any excess there anywhere. So, yeah, brilliant. Great fun. And, and it's opened my eyes up, and I'm, I'm going to... Retry Mr. Slot Car with a vengeance when our club opens in about a month's time. Yeah. So you might, hopefully, yeah, go on. Sorry. You may want to consider, not everybody likes that motor. Um, it's a little bit different design um, than a lot of the other S cans out there. It has, um, if, if you look at your picture, the, the laminations on the armature are a little bit thicker than most laminate. It, it just does a few different things than most motors. 
Um, okay. Porky little bugger, um, but you may or may not like it uh, in the car. So, uh, you, you know, you might want to switch to a slotted or an NSR, a little bit smoother than that, I think, depending, again, depending on your track. Yeah, it is pretty short and tight. So um, I think I'll stick an orange slotted in there. Yeah. Give it a bash. Yeah, well, brilliant. If, if it's correct. short and tight, you'll be, I mean, if short and tight, you'll be fine with this. Okay. Well, I'll give it a bash on the first club yeah. night. We've got a sort of exploratory club night to get the track running again, since we haven't touched it for 13 months. And you're going to glue that motor in, right? Well, I'm uh, one of the things I was going to say, I'm surprised there's no screw holes on, on the, the pod mount, because yeah. there is on a motor, but yeah. it's such a tight fit anyway. Yeah. Uh, that's the tightest fit I've ever seen on a, on a motor going into a pod. Yeah. But yeah, I'll, I'll get a little bit of, little bit of glue along here. Yeah, just, just a bit you don't need a whole ton, just just yeah. a tiny little bit, and you know that'll help quiet things down a bit. But Chris, what kind, what type of glue would you use? Like a hot glue, or no, God, no. Just use some. I use um, like shoe goo or E six thousand or LePage's one hundred. Any clear sort of rubberized stuff. Um, and it's easy. It's it's way easier than all that stuff is. You know, once when you want it off, you just grab it with some needle nose pliers or something, and it it comes off like that booger glue they use on magazines to to stick pages on. So it's pretty easy to stick on and off. Yeah, we we got a standard one in the UK called Evo Stick. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just a, a pound or tube in any supermarket, and it's perfect for that. And as you say, you can just you know you can just sort of peel it off like that snot they put in magazines. Yep. All right, Martin, have you got the um, front axle control screws in place? It looks like I can see down through one of the grub screw you holes. Can, you can see through both of them, Wayne, but it doesn't need it. It's it's so well measured. There's, there's actually two underneath lifting them up a touch. But it doesn't need any any downward control. It's it's I don't know. It's just a really, the more I look at this, the more it's a it's a very very well thought out chassis, and I, I think we don't give it enough cre credence in the UK. So I'm gonna try and push it at the club a bit. Yeah, and there, there's a bunch of news. There's there's a bunch of things in the works that'll be coming that are really quite impressive versus some of the plastic stuff that's out there. All right, that that's one for the colonies. Yeah. <laughs> what, what I would do, Martin, on, on this one, I, I would put this on a block and touch, touch the, the front corners of the chassis plate and push them down with your finger when it's, when it's on, the, when it's on a, a flat block. And if you, if you see the, um, uh, the uprights for the front axle bending down a bit, or pushing down a bit, you should install some uh, grub screws so that when you push down, the chassis does not move downwards. Yeah, you, you can't see what I'm doing, but yeah, there's about a mill and a half movement where the, uh, the so, chassis mount is sort of dropping. Yeah, so what happens when the car goes around a corner, the front wheel will let that chassis come up. And because the tires are so hard, it push, just push down with your finger on one side. And, you, and now look at, the, look at the opposite side rear wheel. Oh, yeah. Okay. Look at, look at this guy jumping. Right. If, so as, as the car leans into the corner and moves into the corner, you go up onto the outside tire, which gets really squirrely. So you want to put a grub screw in the one you're pushing down and adjust yep. it so that the opposite rear tire does not come off the ground. Right. Um, and, in, the sh in, in a break shortly, I'll go and do that, actually. And, and the bottom grub screws, to be perfectly honest with you, are completely useless. Yeah, okay. They'll, they'll well, come out and go to the top. When your car's on the track, the axle's up. Right, so they don't yeah, do yeah, anything. yeah, 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 yeah. But the top two are critical to, um, and much more so on a wood track than on a than on a plastic track. But you 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 need that chassis solid so it doesn't lift the opposing rear wheel off the grid. Yeah, it's it's only doing it one sided though. 
Well, that can yeah, that can be just a bit of chassis twist or or whatever. Um, but using using that method is great to eliminate any little. You're never going to get the chassis perfectly perfectly flat. Yeah. So once you've got any car set up, it's always a good idea to go back to the front axle, and and do exactly what you're doing now, and that will slightly compensate for any little bit of chassis twist. Right. That's interesting. I'm going to get start writing again now because I forget when I go back and I look on the videos, I forget to write it down. Uh, Chris, so, sorry to interrupt, but with the chassis twist like that, would the body also inhibit the twist or no? Depends how you have the body mounted. Okay. If you have the body mounted, you know, like we were talking last week, if you reef up all the screws on the body, it can twist or untwist the chassis depending on the, the posts on the body. So never assume that anything on a slot car that's made out of plastic is flat and square. Like you, you really got to go and check everything. Check it with the body off, check it with the body back on. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, I mean, put the body on and when the body sits on the chassis, go around with your finger where the body posts meet the chassis plate and sort of figure is one high, is one low, is one off, is one up, you know. So it's, it's all finicky little stuff, but it does pay dividends. Good stuff. Uh, before we move on to more show and tell, uh, Nick is here and he wanted to talk a little bit about Area 71, his experience with Area 71. Whenever you're ready, Nick, go ahead. How are we guys? We all right? Yep. We all well? Hey, Nick. Hiya. Um, yeah, just a couple of observations I watched on Catch Up last week's and Gio was talking about his Area 71 Bentley. Uh, well, a couple of subjects, actually, because you also touched on uh, chassis flatness with uh, a 3D printed chassis. Um, a few weeks ago, I ordered a Corvette, Corvette C8R. Uh, got it from Pendles. Um, chassis. I don't know whether you'll see. Got it on setup plate. I haven't touched that. That's as it is out of the box. And that is perfectly flat. That's absolutely dead flat. You, Lucky you boy. And that's, you, a, you, that's, that's one of the uh, nylon uh, printed ones, right? Like Shapeways? Yeah. yeah. You, you would not, if you put that in boiling water with magnets and whatever, you would not get it any better than that. Um, whether that's just luck, I don't know. But as I say, the, the quality of that is very good. Um, what Gio was saying about his body, the marks he got in his body, uh, like swirl marks from the printing. Um, again, I mean, I look at I look at my body. I've got it here. I don't know. There you go. There you go. The only the only ones I can see are sort of God, work this right. Just sort of here. There's a couple of little swirl marks, and then sort of in the centre of the roof. Now, I've painted quite a few bodies. Um, I like to think I'll do quite a good job. Um, I've, I've done enough of them to look at this and go, all right, a couple of light coats of filler primer, sand, just gently sand it down and that will be good to go. And that will be a really, really good paint finish on that car. Uh, whether Geo's is just a bad print, whether it's a, an older design than the C8, so their um, process is now better. I, I don't know. But looking at the quality of his and looking at the quality of what I've got, mine is a lot better quality. I think the main, um, the main issue was that Geo, Geo thought that it didn't need anything other than regular primer. So he didn't put a filler primer on. He, he was just using regular right. minor primer. And so he was not getting the results he expected because he didn't yeah. know that it needed to be a filler primer. Um, again, I, I noticed he said something about hot, like holes. He, like there was some place there was holes in his print. Yeah, there were um, no holes. Yeah, nothing. There's no holes in this whatsoever. 
So I, I don't know whether it's something to do with the design of that specific car. I don't, I don't know. Um, weight, weight was another thing. I noticed his Bentley weighed like 19 grams, 19 point something. This weighs 12 and a half. And the Bentley's a big car. Yeah. But I, like the, the size of the rear diffuser on that Bentley, it looked huge, like quite out of proportion, I thought, to the back end of the car. Yeah. Where, whereas this, this looks, this looks lovely. And he was this surprised is. that they included the, the diffuser on the body rather than as an, something you could attach to the chassis. Yeah, well, I mean, you put, put you can put the chassis under it, and I, I don't know whether you'll see it if I hold it up. I think you'd be able to quite reasonably, once you got in, into the nuts and bolts of it, I think you'd be able to separate this and attach it to the motor pod. I, th I think that would be possible. That's something I'll look into as, as I go through the build. But overall, lo looking at the quality of what I have and what Geo was showing last week, um, un unfortunately, I, I think that the Corvette is a su superior model to the Bentley. And I think that's what Gio was trying to get across, that the, the uh, Bentley was not ready as a product to be on the market with mm. the holes in the back, the, the surface finish that he that it got, and yeah. the general weight and, and volume of the, uh, you know, just, just general size of the car. Yeah. It was the only, I, I think they're the only manufacturer making that body shape at the moment, aren't they? So that's yes. why he went and bought I believe one. so, yeah. I mean, I mean, as Greg says, I mean, the Bentley is a big car, as, as is the BMW M8. I mean, that we've all seen the memes on Facebook about how big the Bentley is compared to other cars. The uh, BMW, sorry, but it was just—I don't know. There was just something about the back of that Bentley that he showed. It just looked out of proportion. The, yeah, the rear diffuser just looked huge. It looked massive. I don't know why they didn't put the diffuser on the back of the um, chassis. Because it's a little bit a universal chassis, will it? No, they're all, they're normally all designed for each particular um, model, Wayne. Um, yeah, Dennis, you've done no a few um, yeah, there's no adjustments. Yeah, I've got a few, and yeah. there's no, there's no adjustment on the chassis, so they make a chassis for each car. For each car, um, yeah. But I I would agree with Nick. The 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 um, C8 uh, was a was a really good print. Uh, whether it's the shape of the body that just uh, naturally makes it better for uh, the process or whether, or whether it, there is some change, I don't know. But um, the C8 that I did came out, came out pretty good. I mean, I'm not, I'm yeah. not a painter. <laughs> I'm not up to, I don't think I'm up to, to, to mix level, uh, but um, there's mine. Um, and I was it's pretty happy with car. it. I was, I was pretty happy with it the way that it came out. Uh, yeah. You know, I got up real close in that photo, so I guess that that will, um, you know, give you an idea. Um, there were a couple of tricks that I that I did on mine. For example, when you come to cutting the when you come to cutting the headlight lenses and things like that, uh, the, or the taillight lenses particularly, they're very small. Yeah. Um, so what I did there was I painted the I painted the red and the yellow into the um, into the background. Oh, into the into the the, uh, the the hollow, and I covered it with a with a clear resin that's um, UV uh, UV um, activated, and I just uh -huh. built it up slowly until it looked about right to, for the lens, and uh, it actually looks really really good. I didn't try it on the front ones because they're bulbous, but I think yeah. I probably could and still get it looking pretty good. Yeah, and um, for anyone who's interested, this is how they come in the packet. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're, they're just a, yeah, but just a clear Lexan sheet. Well, it's it's uh, PTG. It's not Lexan, right. but uh -huh. yeah, um, so that's how they come. Just uh, it's, it's back it's like, like that. It's like a bubble pack, is is what it is. So yeah, yeah. you've got to be very careful how you cut those. I I imagine. <laughs> the, yeah, the lenses are the worst. The the the, the um, yeah, the, the 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 windows are fine. They, yeah, they that's, work, that's, that's they the windows. Great. No problems. Yeah, that's how the windows come. Mm -hmm. 
yeah and they were they were pretty accurate and they fit they fit quite nicely when yeah. you're done mm -hmm. so the body the body chassis pack is about 68 pound i looked them up after last week's meeting yeah, yeah. What's the, finish, could, what's the finished car end up costing? Oh, about $120 <laughs> or so, I suppose, by the time you're done. Mm -hmm. um, and then because you've got to put in, you know, you've got to put in a, a, a pod and a motor and gears and guide and yeah. um, and all those bits and pieces. So it's not an, it's not a cheap car by the time you're done, but they so, run really well. Yeah. So why is, it, why is it worthwhile if uh, Slot 8 and many other manufacturers can produce a complete car for £70? Well, they can't use the C8R right now. And yeah, because slot it don't do a C8R, do they? <laughs> you know, you've got to you got to understand if you're a Corvette man, you've got to have it now. I mean, it's not like you've got to. You know, there it, is it was no like, such thing as delayed gratification involved no, in this sport whatsoever. Was, I, I made I made the big mistake when the Ford GT first came out. I bought the Carrera one first instead of waiting for the scale electric one. And the Carrera one was massively heavy. I mean, it, it, I don't know, as thin as I could get it, I could still only get it down to about 28, 29 grams body. It was ridiculously heavy, even when I'd finished. Carrera. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know if you do this, Nick, but on, on all of your glass, if you take a Sharpie, yeah. and outline the glass that you want to cut out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got Separate a it all. Line to, to follow as opposed to just arbitrarily cutting all this clear stuff. And it, it seems yeah. to help out quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. I'll separate all the all the separate um, apertures out. I'll separate. I'll, I'll do all that. I'll separate all those. Yeah, out and, and if you need a little bit, just sort of, you know, mark the edge with a Sharpie and sand it or file it because... You know, cutting too much is cutting too little is okay. Cutting too much out of the headlights is is not a good thing. <laughs> not not a good thing, no. <laughs> yeah, there was some discussion on one of the Facebook groups. I, I think it was Area Seventy One. They were they posted a video showing a resin print car crashing head on into a brick. Yeah, and, I saw that. Yeah, and their nylon printed car crashing head on in there. Well, this is why we're not doing resin. Yes, you can get very nice prints out of a resin printing machine, but this is why we're not doing resin bodies. And I'm, I'm like, well, there's a trade-off. You know, there's there's a lot of people who would who would be happy with a slightly more brittle body, not planning to wall it, uh, and not have to do quite so much work and to to finish it. And their response was, you know, obviously we know, you know, there's there's a varying levels of work, and different people will will you know, appreciate that work more or less than other people. But they said that they have a new finishing process that they're experimenting with. And they, they expect that they're, that once they perfect that, that their nylon bodies will maybe not be quite as nice as the resin prints, but a whole lot closer. Mm -hmm. So that it can be just a regular prime, not a filler prime, and then, you know, paint it. So I'm yeah. looking forward to seeing what, what that actually turns out to be. And I'm wondering, you know, maybe these C8s are some of their early, no, you don't think, you don't think they're doing any new finishing on those? Okay. Well, we'll hopefully yeah. we'll see some new, newly finished. Not yet. No, because I had, I've had my C8 for a good couple of months now. Okay. It's, it's not a, it's not a brand new, um, it's not a brand new print. Yeah. They're not new, well, are they? They've, they've no, been out. They've, they've been out a while. Yeah. Is the Bentley newer than the C8? The Bentley's newer than the C8. Okay. I wonder if um, maybe they didn't catch some... Maybe maybe Geo got a bad body that, that managed to work its way through QC or something because a hole in the body... Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I found, I found spots, if you if you look at it, because they, they really are trying to keep the weight down to a minimum. So yeah. I found spots like on a... I had a, 99, a 991 Porsche that I've just finished, and uh, in the in the the where the where the um, the a pillars are uh, from the on the roof as the, they come up from the front and then they've got a little piece a uh, little flat section there that you can glue the, the the window clear window on when you're done like a little bit of window frame and they're not always attached sometimes there's a little split there a little gap right, right? because they're trying to print they're trying to print it as thin as they can and um, 
you know, so you get these, you get these little gaps everywhere now and then, but in the structural areas of the body, uh, they're perfect. Yeah. What, what, yeah. When are they coming out with the, their brick model? The brick, <laughs> brick model? Yeah. That they're running the cars into. So you have something yeah. to hit. Exactly. You need something to hit. Uh, we ran, yeah, we did that at Electric Dreams a little while back too. Um, with a with a slotted car because some <coughs> guys were, were complaining about slotted cars being being um, uh, fragile. So we crashed a a Matra um, 670B into a brick and it bounced back with absolutely no problem. Did, did you actually put a little test drive dummy inside or no? No, no, no. <laughs> oh my gosh, that would have been. What a yeah, real. We'll get to the crash test dummies at some point. Yeah. <laughs> now the dummies were behind the camera, John. <clears throat> Those mattresses are a pretty robust shape, though, aren't they? They're a fairly good tub. Oh yeah, it was a, it was a, it was quite a good choice for that kind of work. Yeah. Henri yeah, used to smack them in the things, didn't he? GT forty probably wouldn't have fared quite so well. No. <laughs> Anybody else got any uh, show and tell they want to share? Do, do, do. Go ahead, Mike. Ah, let's see if I got anything there. Uh, actually, I just had the unboxing. Uh, I've got the Carrera stock car, the um, Plymouth, and a slotted Lola. Yeah, I've got I've got the Mazda livery Lola, Lola, and I love it. Um, it's really a really a quick car. And then the piece de resistance, nine thirty five Porsche. Who makes that? Carrera That's a new one. Carrera one. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. I really <coughs> like that. What group is that? Is that like classic GT or something? What? No, that's a new car. That's yeah, uh, a current car. What they did is they took a, I think it's a 991 and a GT3 or GT2 rather, and uh, and made it into a clone, well, a retro. Uh, an homage. The uh, the 935. Okay. It, um, but it, underneath, it's a new car. It's a GT2. Interesting. Just but Mike. It's a nice car. It looks like it's Mike. got a tail tail on it or something. Mm -hmm. well, Mike, it, just, what's that? Just be aware that if you change the rear tires, that the yeah the tires on that car or well, the wheels on that car are very strange because the inner um, the inner rim is is much smaller than the outer diameter, so it's not going to take a stock tire unless you build up ah. the, the unless you build up the inner bead, so that it's the same diameter as the outer bead, right? For some reason uh -huh. or other, they've they've made this crazy wheel that's got a that's got a much deeper bead on the inside than on the outside. Well, time for new wheel. <laughs> yeah, it means you're going to buy my tires, doesn't it? Well, or, or three or four layers of masking tape, which is what I did on, on, on a car that I had to change tires for. Why, Carrera, why? You yeah. could put CA yeah. glue, grind it down to the uh, diameter then. Say again? There's a few layers of CA glue. You can put CA glue in and, and um, cyanoacrylic glue, yeah. super glue, and then uh, turn it down to the proper diameter. You could do that too. You could do that, but that's going to take some time. Yeah. Um, I found yeah, I found I, I cut I cut a strip of masking tape about it's like two and a half or three millimeters wide, and I wrapped mm -hmm. it around there and five layers five layers of masking tape, and then it was up to the same size as the outside, and then the um, there's there's a tire that fits the other career the other Porsche nine nine seven so from Carrera. I uh, can't remember the number mm -hmm. or the numbers offhand, but then they fit fine. Do we think it grips better with the smaller inside <laughs> diameter then? Do you think I they've actually done something to try and make? Carrera, Carrera will not ever make any decision based on performance, Wayne. So um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not, I have no idea why they did it. I've seen it before. <laughs> I've not seen it on a slot car, but I've seen it. Carrera has, I think, I mean, apart from the monogram in the 60s, the so many variations of tire sizes and widths and it's amazing it's almost like every time that they get a new 
model to build, they give it to some new guy in the in the factory, mm-hmm. and um, and somebody else has a go at the whole thing, and they don't bother to look at what anybody else did before that. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe because of the quality of the cars, the last guy well, got fucked. You can see. <laughs> <laughs> if if you look, you can see that the tires actually are cambered. I don't know if you can see that or not. Let's see. If, if you look at it closely, it's you can see that the, on the, the inner rim is smaller than the outer. Yeah. So it's, yeah, you it's can got, see uh, it slightly. Yeah. I don't know why it's, they. Uh, it's pretty subtle. I mean, I can see it, but it's hard to show on camera. The straight um, edge. Yeah. Me, thanks for that. I appreciate it. I'll pay attention to that. Take another magnet on, Mike. You'll never know the difference. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Touche. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My wheels still have to be round and true. No, absolutely. Anybody else got the show and tell they want to show and tell? Oh, what about the what about the new guy on there? I see Anthony Bartlett on here today. I haven't seen that face in many, many years. Who am I not seeing? Anthony B. Oh, he's talking oh, to me. He's talking okay. to me. But you never, never mind, Anthony. Those boxes behind you look epic. <laughs> <laughs> it's where some of the stuff is is stuck. Hey, Dennis. Good to see you again. Long time, man. You too, sir. Yeah, but good you've lost you. your accent. I mean, you, you, I, I can't, I can't work it out exactly what it is anymore. It's, it's not quite uh, South African. It's not quite it, American. It's African American, yeah. but a different, a different kind of African American. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, it, down that road. It, it's white. It's well, it's a southern accent from the deep, deep south. <laughs> <laughs> Very deep south. Yeah. Good to see you, man. Yeah, you too. Anthony, Anthony, and I used to race one twelve scale radio control cars together in South Africa many, many, many years back. Yeah, and uh, he's in a slot race, but he lives in Belgium now. For my sins. <laughs> For your sins. <laughs> Actually, no. It's a, it's a it's a great country. Now that I mean, we're of an age. I mean, not. I don't need London or New York or Rome or Paris. <laughs> so it is a very uh, um, sedate lifestyle. Let's put it that way. Um, and a great as I can beer. speak. As I can speak one of the official languages I get around, so that's fine. Um, yeah, enjoy it, Tom. Cool. Awesome. Right, so, aren't, we do, aren't we do a couple of slot histories? We've got two new faces. Well, Anthony's been on before. I think he gave us a slot history before. Uh, I, I, I think that was one of them. I was on okay. one of your first ones, but I haven't been yeah, on since. Been very early. Yeah. I don't think it's <laughs> one of the oh. first ones, yeah. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen you before. Oh, I, we've, we've sort of emailed back and forth and done stuff on forums, but has anyone ever tell you you look like Joe Pierre Van Rossen's brother? <laughs> oh, please, no, don't. Hey, it don't. looks identical. No, don't, don't, don't say that. Yeah, don't say no, that. Jump, jump here, no, no. and I didn't get on at all. I well, tell you that much. no, I, I, I joined the club. Um, but God, you look like. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, oh, listen, I don't have the long hair. Yeah, but only if he lost seventy-five pounds. Well, and yeah, and I, and I chain smoked. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, John, 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 I, I raced the two Imco Worlds, and um, Jean Pierre and I just did not get on. I can't get on with dictators. I've never been able to, and. Um, I'm oh, sorry. I, I, I thought I thought he was just a fraudster. I'm sorry. Oh yes, he, he well, well he had a terrible true. reputation in this country. Um, that the most Belgians hated him. Um, he um, uh, stood up and I can't remember the exact wording of what he said in. Vive la République. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And 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 they said that just before they killed somebody. If that's not if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. And uh, he stood up and said it in, in Parliament here, and, and uh, they, they hated him for it. Um, uh, anyway, let's not get on to John. Yeah. yeah let's I'll, I'll just give you a, a small slot history. I started slots, I guess, in, in 63, when I got my first K electric set. Um, 
I've been on and off slot, sadly. I've, I think I sold everything in 1972 or 73 to buy a bicycle. <laughs> Didn't come from a wealthy family and I needed a 10 speed bike, so that's how I got it. Then I started again in the 80s um, and then sold up everything again. What an idiot. I sold up everything again in about 2002 before I went back to South Africa. And then when I came back out of South Africa in 2007, I started up again. But now I literally have behind me just about 96% of everything I have is, is not what you guys have been talking about. Although it's very interesting to watch what you do. It's all hand-built stuff. I, I build stuff up. Um, and I definitely <laughs> not... What scale primarily, Anthony? What scale do you build in? Uh, no, I'm about 50-50. So 124th, 1, 132nd. I race a lot at Bordeaux International Vintage Meeting, so I build 75% of my stuff is vintage stuff. Um, I've got boxes and boxes, thank heavens, I've got boxes and boxes of spares. Um, oh, but uh, to be honest with you, I'll never put up a show and tell while Chris Walker and Dennis Sampson are, are on this forum. <laughs> I don't quite get into that class of things. <laughs> That's okay. Don't ever let... I'll show, I'll show you one of the reasons. I don't know if you nope. guys have ever heard of DDR models. Mm -hmm. He's an Italian guy that um, um, produces resin bodies. And, and, and I'm absolutely fanatical about the 612. And this is a 124th. I'll just take the wing off because I haven't secured it. So you can see the detail. This is a 124th 612 that, that he, he put together. I recast the motor because it was a solid lump of resin. So I cost it much smaller and much bigger and then rebuilt the back end completely myself. Um, it has a, Chris has seen this. Um, he was telling me to get rid of the motor. <laughs> but if I have a, to be honest with you, Chris, and, and this is kind of my logic when I do these things, if I have something and I've got a box of 60s built chassis, this was built in the 60s. I don't know who buy, I built it off, bought it off a collection of eBay. Um, and I just like to use what I have. This is not very quick at all, and it is quite heavy. I would guess it's in and around 35 grams, 38 grams. It's, it's not light at all. So, but I, I tend to build because I love the car. Um, but then again, when I see what you do with your stuff and that last Lola that you did, I, I mean, there's not very much up here that I'll show you. I think Anthony's, I think Anthony's actually really sort of un underselling himself here. I built a I built a couple of chassis for him some years back, yeah. And uh, just to give you an indication, these were the chassis. Can you see that? Yep. Yeah, they uh, were awesome. But right, so that was the this was the galaxy that it went under, right? But that's yep. the galaxy when it was done, and that's all Anthony's work, right? Oh, that's go That's gorgeous. And then he had this charger as well. And the charger had a full engine in the front. Oh, that's right? come on. So come awesome. on, tell me, don't that tell me excellent. you can't build. Uh, look, I really can. excellent. And I don't and I don't want to I don't want to make excuses. Dennis, you will understand what I'm saying. I unfortunately was in the South African Defense Force and I was in Angola for quite a period of time. And when I start to do really finicky work, and it affects me when I paint, okay, my hand shakes. With a result, I can't paint a straight line. So if I try to paint like a window rim, it turns out to be three millimeters fat instead of a, just a thin, thin line. So I tend to judge myself on that. Do I put together the car quite well? Yes, I think I do. And I'm not trying to be a big head, but my finishing leaves a lot to be desired. I once oh, called I, one of Chris's cars. I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I suggest you start drinking heavily. <laughs> Might help. <laughs> it looked great. Uh, so that's a, a little bit of my history. I, I think you are suffering cool. from the artist's uh, being too hard on himself mm -hmm. syndrome. Uh, and and if I were to put up one of my jobs, then you would see what uh, what somebody should be ashamed of. But uh, I don't think, even yours are not that bad. Come on. But I don't Seems, think that anybody. It's just should, blue and yellow all the time. That's exactly it, the the appropriate colors for any car are blue and yellow. But my point is, nobody should be ashamed of showing off what they've done because everybody's skill level started at zero 
and got better the more they did it. If I were to do as many cards as Nick has done or Dennis has done or Chris or anybody has done, I would hope that my skill would be better. Maybe not as good as them, but better than I was when I started. Everybody learns at different rates, but everybody starts at zero. And eventually you get to where you are from how many times you did a thing. That's just, everything is like that. Kid. Uh, <laughs> and plus bars. It, it looks so good going around the track, right? The five foot rule wins every time. Yeah. <laughs> what paint did you end up using on that Camaro, Anthony? Uh, do you want to see it? Yeah. Here it is. Did it stick? It's stuck at the moment, but I can tell you right now that um, if uh, this had to take a hit against a wall, like you were talking about earlier, yeah, it would not stick. So I've used, I've used a, 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 an auto plastic primer, yeah, and then an auto paint on top of it. It I did look at that fusion paint, and I would love to have bought a tin, but the cheapest freight I could get for it was about sixty dollars for much? one tin. Sixty dollars. So for a I, tin. Yep, for one tin. Jesus. Because um, it's it's only available in the states, it's or North America. It's not available over this side. Um, so that's what I've used for it, and I've I've also done the. Oh, geez, I can't think of the name. This one's also finished, but uh, there's one more to do. I've got the Mustang still to do, but I'm waiting for for decals for it to come in. So this is and it's the I must be honest with you, when I first saw this Revel chassis, I was not terribly impressed. But once you start seeing it on a flatboard yeah. and on a track, it actually isn't bad, to be honest. Not the greatest, but it's not bad, not as bad as I thought it was gonna be. So those are old Revel cars that you're restoring? Yeah, the boat, oh, but, okay. but, um, cool. I picked one of those that I, I I bought a guy from Denmark had two cheetahs. Cox Cheetahs cheaply, and three of these Revel cars. Um, as I said, the, the Mustang's still got to be done, and I'd like to try and lay my hands on a Firebird, but uh, uh, the ones that are doing their rounds on eBay at the moment are awful, so I'll keep looking. Well, they look great to me. Thank uh, you very much. So, Appreciate so thanks, it. Thanks for sharing that stuff. Uh, Don, I don't think we've heard your slot-related history. Would you like to share? Well, I talked to some guys last week about some of that. Uh, I basically started somewhere around 65 or 66 when I got my first Eldon and Aurora slot car track. Uh, I've basically been collecting Aurora ever since then. I got about 500 original Aurora cars. Uh, last year, around June or July, I decided, decided to start playing with my Eldon stuff again. And it has gotten me to here with now a Carrera digital track and a hybrid analog track set up and a HO scale track setup. So I got three tracks set up. Yeah, El Eldon was the starter drug, wasn't it? Uh, I, I leaned more towards HO back then because of the amount of space that it took up and the availability that has never been available to me on being able to do stuff. So I, you can see my HO scale track behind me there uh, I, I call all of my race tracks uh slop car raceways because none of them are finished and they probably never will be because every time i think i got it or i want it i want to change it again so it's just a money pit for me to throw things and acquire things and that's really what I like to do. But what got me started in all this, and this is my show and tell, was my grandfather. This is some of his work. Yeah. 
Is that carved? Yes. Wow. And what is it? It's a, well, it's a fly, uh, a billman at a circus. Okay. That's awesome. Ah. Wow. Just with a knife and a chunk of wood. That's brilliant. Cool. Beautiful. Well, I'll have some other pictures to show you all later, but he carved an entire three ring circus to scale. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I showed you his work. This is some of mine. That's good, too. That's very good. And I used to do a lot more, but the older I get, the harder it gets. So that's one of the things that made me go from HO to 132nd is, is I can actually see those parts. The HO is getting kind of hard. <laughs> yeah. That's and, impressive. And, and handwork. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not 50 yet. I've turned 50 this year, but I, I pretty much stopped doing all the handcrafted leather work that I used to do because every time I'm, Every time I'm doing another tooling project, my hands get all crampy and sore. It's like, nope, I don't want to do that anymore. So I can imagine trying to trying to do, you know, tiny little models and stuff like that. You are a spring chicken. Wait till I you know, get to that. right? <laughs> Remember, 50 is the new 30, man. Oh, I guess I'm already dead. <laughs> what, what, what about Mark? I, I, I don't, I don't. Geez, John, who's the host here? I'm sorry. I was, I was about to say, Mark, you, Hang on. you're a new face to me. Would you like to share your slot history with us? Hi, guys. Yeah, sure. I I think I've actually watched all the previous episodes. I'm up to like 32 now. <laughs> and I, I laugh because I, I, I look at it. It's almost like going to slot car school. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, every class is, you know, I, I find out something I, I didn't know before, but I, I really enjoy it. Um, they all do. <laughs> if, if I can share my screen, I, I got a, a picture's worth a thousand words, so I can Be probably able. show you a couple things. Uh, okay, and yeah. Can you guys see that? Yeah, not yet. You got to click share and then click the window oh, you're sharing. Got to click share. Yeah. And then click share again one final time. There we go. All right. Can you see that? Yep. So, this is actually, it's, it's so old. I mean, this is probably the first, it wasn't even slot cars thing that can remember. It's my older brother's set he got. It's probably around 1962. It was this it was old ideal toy company. It's like actually a rail car. This isn't the set actually, but it was just like this one. Had a couple of Mercedes. And I remember my dad had built this on a board in the basement, like a three by five and mounted it, had it set up for Christmas. And it was like the hit of the Christmas party. All the all the kids loved it I was just you know it's one of those things and I was like four years old and I could still remember it I mean that was why how much it, you know impression it had on you so then you really didn't you know it was my older brothers play with it and it who knows whatever happened to it and then probably around through, through the 60s I of course like a lot of kids I collected matchbox cars and I had my matchbox city Hot Wheels. I used to play with them all the time because I, you know, love cars. And uh, of course, that was the whole period. I, like a lot of people my age, I mean, that was the whole Ford versus Ferrari era. You know, every car set, whether it was Hot Wheels or Matchbox, they had a 4J car and a 4GT. And uh, around 1970, I mean, my favorite like car movie, a lot of people, it's Grand Prix, me, it's Le Mans. Um, I, you know, Steve McQueen is great, even though it's not, there's no, uh, it's, it's, there's no drama. It's, it's a documentary, really. There's no plot <laughs> uh, to the movie at all. But my older brother got an AFX Christmas set. He had just got out of high school and his girl that he ended up marrying bought him one for Christmas. Well, you know, he played with it for like five minutes and then I inherited it. And uh, I played with my Matchbox cars and the HO cars and everything. I had a really good time. And of course, then I, you know, got into junior high and high school and forgot all about slot cars and everything. Uh, and then probably around to 1999, um, somebody gave me an HO set. I remember my, my wife maybe is a gag gift. I don't know. And I 
play with it and I, I bought some track and set it up and I was you know looking at it you know I had a little track set on the table in the basement was getting into it and then I saw fly cars at 132 scale <laughs> and then I saw the the variety of cars that were available even even then at, at that scale and I thought you know yeah these little cars are nice but that's what I really want to do and um, that was just about the same time that Arton became available um and they had those huge sets, like the four lane sets for, you know, really inexpensive. And I bought uh, one of those, the two lane set and uh, set it up in the basement. And this was the first track I had at that time. Um, oh, where's, where's, the, the, where's, the, where's the circuit Schweizbaden? Schweizbaden, yeah, that's what I call it. Cause Schweitzer basically in German is Swiss. So even though they don't race in Switzerland, I don't. I, I know they didn't used to. I don't know if they still don't. Um, so this was my my fantasy track, and I came up with something that was, you know, set in the uh, Alps somewhere. Um, and you'll see some real old school like scenery techniques, or used to like back when you used to get paper uh, grocery bags, you crush them all up, and then use that to make it look like rocks and. Uh, so I had this probably from, you know, like 2000 to probably 2008, you know, family, most of my racing, it's, it's friends and family, uh, you know, they just come over and enjoy it. I'm a magnet racer. Um, I like to fill it with the cars as, as little as possible, although I'm, I'm intrigued by the possibility of scratch building and doing some other stuff, cars that, you know, aren't available, you know, I'd like to like try and get in some. So I had this track for a while. Eventually it came down and then I built another track, you know, which was called the Schweizer Ring. And this was a, a much bigger track. It was probably about, I don't know, maybe I say much bigger, like 45, 48 feet, maybe it was like a U-shape. And uh, I really, uh, if you can't tell, I'm really in the scenery building. I, I like to, again, it goes back to that kid-like imagination. Um, you know, this little fantasy world you come up with. And it was, again, that same theme but even more so and uh even with the art and track with the different curves and everything you could get you know a pretty interesting track a lot of different levels and this was fun i had this old castle i from an old set i had given my son which he would quit playing with a long long time previous and uh fitted it in and these are like kind of actually construction picks i didn't take a picture of this track when it's finished because probably about three years ago, it, it came down. The space in the basement, we were remodeling the basement. And my wife says, we, we need that space for something else. <laughs> so this all had to uh, had to come down. And I'll, I'll quit sharing now. But uh, I remember so, seeing that track. I remember seeing the posts of you posting that track and the buildup and all that stuff. And that I love that track. <laughs> so yeah, it, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, so right now I'm, I'm trackless, although I recently figured out a way I can, uh, in the same similar space, build a track that will fold up against the wall where that one was, and actually it'll come down and I can, you know, leave it down. The, the problems I'm working out there, it's, it's got to be modular because it's going to fit into a box that's about seven and a half inches deep. So nothing can be taller than that. So all the buildings and everything that has to be modular can come out. And my goal is to, so I can hook it, everything back up maybe in about 15 minutes and have it, you know, ready to go. So, but that's going to be a little bit, probably till fall till I can get started on that. So in the meantime, I'm doing things like, you know, going through my collection, see how many, you know, cars I got and putting them in a spreadsheet and just doing other things. And I might try, you know, maybe building a couple cars, you know, and, uh, trying to rework a few that I have in the meantime, but, uh, I, yeah, I, I love, really I enjoy love the, the, I love the uh, paper though. I, 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 it's like 3D scrunching. That's awesome. Yeah, I, that's, that's a real old school modeling trick. I think back in the 60s, you could look in. Yeah. And my background too, I mean, I have a lot of other hobbies. Um, you know, I, I study a lot of architecture. I, I came from a background like a lot of people, military modeling and like war gaming. So, you know, if you can, uh, you know, if you can paint these little guys. Oh, yeah. You know, you can you can paint a 132 figure. <laughs> yep. So uh, that's pretty much my background. Um, you know, the the more technical aspects of sporting, you know, and, and building things and stuff is, uh, you know, intriguing. I want to get into that more. But my goal is get my 
you know, go get my track built and then kind of focus on a lot of the other things uh, I do. But really, I'm, I'm an Akron. You know, I'm an Akron Mark in most all the uh, um, forums. So there aren't a lot of clubs around here. I mean, I know there are some racers, a uh, place locally I knew where there was some, but, you know, they're more like, um, you know, racers, racers and uh, Lexan bodied stuff and, you know, not, not the kind of stuff I, you know, interests me a little bit more, but that's where I'm at. And I just, again, want to thank you guys. You guys, I've, I've watched lots of John's videos. Um, and I know, uh, so I know you're, Dave you're, Kennedy you're, when he. So Mark, a lot you're of the one, there. you're the one. Thank you so much. <laughs> hey, I know I'm. <laughs> yeah, what about Paul? He watches your stuff too. Oh, wait, Paul, oh Paul, you're here. Yeah, I've seen Paul. Yeah, and, and who could forget your mother, John? Yeah. Oh, like John, I, I came from advertising too. That's all. Oh, that's there you go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, same. Okay. You, were you an account guy or a creative guy? I was a little bit of everything. I started as a copywriter, and then I I cleaned up pretty well, and they let me do account work. And the last place I worked, I was actually the the creative director. So, I more on the creative side. So. Okay, so you're you're the Don you're the Don Draper then. Uh, not quite as talented, not nearly as good looking. <laughs> well, thanks very much for joining us, Mark. It's good to have you on here, and it was it's fun to put a face to a name that I've seen for several years now. Uh, so hopefully you can continue to join us in the future. Uh, since we've had some time for people to think about it, does anybody have any other show and tell they want to share? before I dig out a topic from the bin of topics. Um, Go ahead, Dennis. Just while we're on paint jobs. Oh, Dennis first. Uh, Nick, go, go. And then we'll get um, Wayne after Dennis. <laughs> uh, what, a project I did, uh, we were gonna run it at the Disc of Le Mans uh, before it got canceled. And, and literally as I painted this car, Scale Electric announced they were going to release it. This was my pride and joy. Oh, yeah. wow. I spent hours doing this. Um, the paint came from uh, Zero Paints through Hero Boy. It's the color matched to the wind's purple. Uh, the Scale Electric car is slightly lighter than this. The, pur the purple is a bit different, but um, this is the color matched one. So, uh, sorry, but yours looks better. Uh, I'll, I'll, you can't imagine how gutted I was when Scale Electric announced they were going to do it. And then, of course, the race was on then to get it raced and on a track before Scale Electrics came out into the shop. But, of course, then, like, Le Mans got cancelled and it hasn't been on a track yet. So I was a little bit gutted about that. But, um, yeah, it's it's really pretty. When when it all lights up, a guy called Adam Le Maestre did all the lights for it. Um, bright lights. It's got the purple lights in under the tunnels i don't know whether you can see the leds under there like that yeah. just oh, under yeah. there's there's little leds under there just just like the real car oh, wow <laughs> um yeah a, a lot of hours and effort went into that i was gutted i couldn't race it before scale electric released theirs <laughs> someone ran a wins 20 a wins uh gt4 t yeah, sorry 4 gt in 2019, didn't they? Uh, Did you garage 27 run one. Oh, that was mine. But that was the that was the Carrera one. That was the rubbish one. Ah, it was the Carrera body shell. Yeah, that was the rubbish one. That's a Sky Electric one. <clears throat> Got yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, as you that know, was I ran uh, myself. I was in Tamar's team, and we ran the same. Right. Oh, we ran the scale electric body shell, but it wasn't in any of those. Yeah, that's right. There, there is a there is a picture somewhere of mine and the one you race side by side, side, by side on Buckingham's track. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because if you look at it closely, Tamar's is slightly smaller. The Carrera, I hadn't noticed. Yeah, the Carrera body shell is slightly bigger than the scale electric one. That adds to the weight as well, of course. Got yeah. But that that's the new improved version of that car. It'll get its day, I'm sure. Probably abroad. <laughs> fingers crossed. Fingers yeah, crossed. I hope so. I hope yeah, so. Fingers crossed. What do you got, Dennis? Oh, today I'm busy with uh, stuff that you know that you guys don't really race very often, and that's uh, oh. steel, one twenty-four scale uh, steel chassis 
with an angle winder motor that's going to get a Formula One body on it for a, a class that's called JRL out here. Um, it was started by JK Products originally, and it was for JK IRL cars. And so they called it JRL. Nowadays, it's basically a generic Formula One class. So this was a, um, a, a spring steel kit <clears throat> that, I, that I got when you buy it. It's basically just a sheet of spring steel with all the pieces cut out. And then everything fits into little slots. Uh, the parts all have little tabs and slots that fit in. This one, this one came out of Brazil. Uh, I've got another one here that came out of uh, the UK. This is a fellow by the name of Richard Mack who makes this. Uh, some of you guys may know him. And um, so I'm just busy putting these together. The weird part about these is when you, you, when you get them, they've got like 50 parts and there's no instructions. You basically have to know roughly how it works or work off a photograph of one that's been, that's been done and then work out where each individual little piece goes. And there are some tiny little pieces involved here, particularly if you start looking at the back corner here where there's all sorts of little movements and things that are controlled by little... Um, tabs and, and, and uh, little um, straight pieces of spring steel. Uh, so it takes a little bit of time, but uh, yeah, so this is what I'm working on. De Dennis, is, is the motor soldered in? Yeah. Yeah, uh, if you look at it from underneath, it's soldered in along the, along the front edge here and right. then along the rear here. And you solder it in while you have the gears meshed the way that you want them meshed. Normally what I do is I put a little piece of very thin paper in between the gears and then mash the motor up against the gear. Also a little piece of, of uh, paper uh, between the axle and the groove that I have to file in the magnet uh, so that the, you know that the axle is not touching the magnet. And then when it's in that position, then you solder it in or you tack it first and then you can turn it over and, and give it a bit more solder. So yeah. So that's what that is. We've got a race coming up this weekend. And so I'm going to try try that, try these two new cars. Dennis, it's a slightly off, off question about that car. What soldering iron do you use? You're muted. Sorry, I was I muted myself. Um, Anthony, when I'm when I'm, I have a couple of different ones. When I'm working at home, I'm using a Weller. Uh, and it's a, it's the, the regular Weller Angar handle with a T33 heater in it, which is a 50 watt uh, chisel tip. Um, it's a little big for some of the work that I'm doing in there. So uh, very often when I'm doing the finer work like that, I'll use another one that I have, which is a Hacko uh, 601X, I think, or FX601, uh, which has a slightly smaller tip, but it's also uh, about a 50, 60 watt iron. And uh, high, you know, high temperatures. And uh, the, the, the big deal is not so much the high temperature, but the fact that it's a, a physically a, quite a big tip when you're soldering big pieces of brass or, stain, or spring steel like that. You don't want the, the workpiece to suck the heat out of the iron too quickly. So the bigger the iron, that you can still use and still get in there, the better. I mean, I see your soldering capacity on Chris's as well, and it's just so neat. And then, and I, and I struggle with mine. So I've come to the conclusion that I have the wrong soldering iron. It's as simple as that. It makes a big difference. It could also, yeah. have, what, what sort of flux do you use, Anthony? Um, I got it from Andy Brown so a, a year or two ago. It's quite a potent flux, to be quite honest with you. Okay, so um, it's like a, it's a liquid acid flux, then. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I mean, you're using the right flux. Solder is important, important, but it's the least important variable. It's probably down to your. It might be your iron. I'm sure it is. I used to have an ungar, but I I don't anymore. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is an. I can't think of the name of it. It's downstairs. It's an Italian make. But okay. I think it's probably 20 years old and I've, I may need a new one. The problem is probably that the tip's not big enough. It doesn't have enough heat capacity. Um, 
But, uh, you know, you can't get Ungars anymore. They're all now branded under Weller, although it's the same, the same thing. Um, okay. I use I use the the T thirty three, which is a which is an integral uh, tip and heater that screws into the handle of the ungar. Uh, okay. I don't like the ones uh, with the screw on tips because after a while the threads with the screw on tip the thread degrades, and then you've got to throw the not only the tip but the heater away as well. Um, the uh, the the hacko. Uh, FX601 is uh, probably an even better iron than most of the Angor or Wellers now, uh, because you know you can you can change out the tips, you can change out the heaters, uh, things like that. It, it's a very okay. very nice iron. So that's the if you're gonna if you're gonna look for an iron, I would suggest the the Hacko FX601. H A C K O. H A K K O. Okay. I'm just gonna get a pin. That's how I'm moving. Hacko. They're very reasonable. Those things. They're not bad price, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, but but a third the price of the Wellers. For the same features. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, as as long as I mean, whatever you get, you can't. The things that are for soldering stations, for soldering computer boards with the little pinhead tips on them, are useless. Dennis has got a it's a quarter inch chisel tip on it, and that's exactly what you need. Anything okay. smaller than that, and you're wasting your time. Okay, that's my that's problem. Fixed, I don't, have a, I don't, I don't nice have, have a microscopic tip on mine, yeah. but it's definitely not quite as big as that. So yeah. I need the nice part about this is about the hacko is that its temperature control is built into the is built into the iron, so you don't have to have a separate um, rheostat or any kind of uh, base in order to uh, control the temperature. Because you almost right. never, you'll almost never solder with the thing turned all the way up. I actually will turn it down. Uh, I mean, this one goes to like 640 degrees Celsius. And uh, I turn it down to like about 460 when I'm doing most of my soldering. And this is, this is a 67 watt iron on 120 volts. So uh, it's, it's potent. Okay. Thank you. I'll look. You're welcome. The only thing about them is, they have a very, when you buy them, they have a very, very thick and inflexible cord. And I opened up mine, and took the cord out, and used an old Weller cord, which is a, just a two <clears throat> wire, and it's which is a lot more flexible and makes it easier to work with. So you, you even scratch built your your soldering yeah. iron. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> modified anyways. <laughs> yeah, modified. Uh, Martin, I saw you raise your hand earlier. Did you had something you wanted to talk about? I think it was before Dennis or while Dennis was talking about his chassis. Uh, it wasn't me, but I've actually gone and put that screw in. I, my camera is pretty bad on this new laptop, but I, I've put the screw in as suggested, and now uh, you can't really see it. that that movement's completely gone. Good. Oh. Yeah, what a, what a difference! I mean, that was a, a three mil lift. Yeah, both both sides. Uh, yeah, the other side was was no issue. Good. But this this right. side was an issue. Yeah, incredible. Put some half decent tires on that. You're off. You're all done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, as they say, every day's a school day. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Wayne, I saw you raise your hand earlier as well. I did. It's a little bit less of a show and tell, and more of hopefully the introduction of a discussion point. Yeah. Uh, I went in the mother-in-law's attic, and pulled out some scale electric sport digital scale electric sport track that's been in there for eight years at least and it's oh, it wasn't a euphemism wayne <laughs> no it wasn't it was the okay. reality it was mother-in-law's attic because i'm in my i'm it i'm currently in our attic and that's where the track is so now when you understand that we need storage space it has to be the mother-in-laws so i'm trying to turn this is going to be difficult with the lighting perhaps and I don't know whether you can see it, but I'm trying to turn track that looks like this, which is not rusty. Tarnished, yeah. It's blackened into track that looks like this. Just because can you see you the difference? Look, is that because you want it to look shiny or because it doesn't work very well? I haven't used it. I don't care for using it whilst it's that black. Um, it won't match well with my new pieces of track. That's one reason. And when I run my finger along the blackened track rails, I can actually feel 
that they're not as smooth as I'd like them to be, or as the car won't be as fast as smooth. So this is really, really slippery by comparison. And I don't know how much of a difference it really makes, but this just looks terrible to me. So I've tried a couple of different methods. I've recently been, uh, seen a video on YouTube that recommended we use a metal polish, such as this one, which is called Solvol Alter Sol. I think it's intended for chrome bumpers for cars. Yeah, it is, yeah. Um, and uh, my favourite method, I don't know what anyone else would use, but my favourite me method is P600 wet and dry paper. When are you trying to track me? Used, used wet. Wayne, why don't you try, why don't you, try a, uh, the, you know the model railways, they, you, they got a, the a rubber. Like a of rubber. The yeah. rubber, yeah, I've tried that. I don't like it. The uh, problem with sandpaper is that eventually you're going to get rust. Right. Because you take the protective uh, covering that prevents the rust off those rails. So yeah. you honestly need to I've, try I've, anything but sandpaper. I've, I've heard that, but this is not sandpaper. It's wet and dry paper, and it's not cutting that much. I'm not cutting it down to the point where it's the, the, the rail is gone. Well, I don't think it's gone bare metal. What are they actually coated in? Nickel. Yeah, nickel. So I don't think I've taken that off. Well, the other trick is is the um, what they do well, to... Tell you what, Wayne. Go and put it outside and uh, leave it as air to see if it rusts. <laughs> well, the the, the piece water, the piece with the blackness up, on the rails would do the foil. same. Try warm water and aluminium foil, scrunched up, and rub it on it, because that yeah. sometimes does chrome. Yeah. Aluminium yeah. foil, sandpaper, Wayne. You'll wreck yeah, it. Baker foil. Yeah, it's baker, baker foil. Yeah, um, I've also seen uh, muck off with the bicycle cleaner. Muck off cuts through it without uh, affecting the metal covering. Well, I have done this before. I've done the P600 grit when dry before, and the pieces that I did it to have not suffered at all. I'm not nervous about it. I've got, I mean, this track, uh, there's actually a date code on the back of all your track, and it's, it's shown in the, in, the, in the form of two mouldings. And this track was moulded in 2002, and there has been a change in insofar as these tabs have gotten bigger since the early 2000s. But uh, so it's it's old track. I've got some I've got some brand new stuff on the floor behind me, which is not actually as I don't think it's as good in terms of finish quality. When I opened the new stuff only last week, a lot of the a lot of the mail pins had got wobble. Um, a lot of, none of this old stuff's got it. I bought this I bought this second hand. I bought it before 2010, and I know it's not been used since before 2010. I don't know how much use it had before. But the rails are all nice and nice and straight, nice and flat. And uh, the only reason I've gone and got this, and I could show you a small pile of it I've got over there, is because, I want, because I, my track's entirely R2. Everything in it is R2. And I thought I'd, I thought I'd like to incorporate some R3 and probably try and make it longer somehow. So the easy way to do that and maximise on the space I've got was to put some R3s around the outside of the R2s and try and make it run in... You know, try and make it run like this at the same one car, you know. So, uh, yeah, I got some R3s. That's what these are. And uh, I knew I'd got them in the attic, so to speak. And I was, I, I, there's only, there's only, I'm, I'm going to try that silver foil uh, method. I haven't heard of that or come across that before. Um, the rubber, I didn't like. It, it was a bit harsh, I thought. And it left little rubbery bits that get between the rails and the track. The silver polish or the, the metal polish, I, I don't know if you can see it down here at this end of this track, but I've got some white residue and it's gone not only into the, the track surface, there's a little tiny bit of it in the track. So I was very careful with it. There's also a little tiny bit in between the rails and the track. And there's a little tiny bit down there in the bottom of the groove. So, with a good clean up, I'll get it. I'll get it back without a problem. But that's the one I did with metal polish, and it took for ages. It took for ages. I'll be honest with you. I would have just put it into. A, I would have just put the tracks into a layout and put some inox on it and called it good because they probably still work 
just as well. And I don't, I don't care if it's shiny or not, as long as it's functional, the Inox will give it, you know, that, that low that film. It'll yeah, well, it'll get that. It'll get that when it gets, yeah, it'll get that when it gets down. And it'll conduct the electricity real nice. It, you know, probably don't need, you know, unless you well, want to shiny, you know. I have to I was say, the, say that maybe the, you could use some Inox on a, on a rag and just actually yeah. see if it would wipe that off. Oh, it probably would take some off, yeah. I could. I mean, look, this is uh, this was the this was the yellow rag before I started the polishing process. Yeah. It's it's actually oh. just a it's just a dishcloth. It's a bit it's a bit it's a bit like a microfiber, but it's not. Yeah. Copper um, tape, you want wing copper tape? Yeah, copper tape. <laughs> no, no copper tape. Nope. Nope. I like, <laughs> I like it looking good. Use Scotch Bright. Nothing abrasive. I've, um, Scotch Bright is the wadding in a tin, is it not? No. no Scotch Bright is like a. Green. Green. It's, a very fine, it's a very fine, like a scourer. Yeah. The green pad, like the yeah, like what's on one side of your dishwashing pad. Yeah. So if you use the if you use the industrial one, it doesn't flake away. I've got some of those. Yeah, there's a Scotch Bright there. I'll, yeah, it. I've got some That's of those. Stuff. In in my in my uh, body filler box in the shed yeah a bit of oh. a bit of inox on that and just rub it rub it rub it so there's two more for me to try silver foil <laughs> inox on a or oh, sorry uh, 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 and a scotch bright pad i haven't brought the scotch bright pad into me slot car racing yet i thought i heard chris's voice did, you have, did, you, have another, did you have another thing for him to try chris no, I was I I was just wondering whether it's is this a performance issue or is this more of a you know aesthetic? No, system? it's not really a performance issue. I can tell you that the, even though the old even though the the track is nearly twenty years old now, the mail pins, the sides of the mail pins, the tops of the mail pins, all still good and clean looking. I don't need to abrade those. I don't need, I don't I've got no concerns about connectivity with that. I just like the idea of my braids staying cleaner. Uh, I like the idea of the fact that the rails are slippery to the touch. You just like shiny things, don't you, you Wayne? Like shiny. Yeah, that's what it is. I like shiny things. Okay. <laughs> Wayne, I, like, I just saw the I just saw the sleeve labour behind you. Why isn't he doing it? Yeah. He, should, he, he's, he should be in bed. He did appear. He's had on my knees. Yeah, that's night, his elbow you? grease. You know, get him to put the elbow grease in. Pocket yeah, money. Long elbows. Yeah, Pocket he's money. Gone, he's gone to bed and he can hear me in the attic, so that's kept him from going to sleep. Send them down the mines, money. that's what I say. Well, the chimney, I thought. <laughs> Mr Underwood, what do you think about slave labour up the chimney? It's been illegal since 1876 or something <laughs> stupid. Like that. Well, you better stop it then, Wayne. <laughs> Don't let anyone know. Yeah. Don't tell your mother. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That was what I just what I wanted to get involved in. I want to, I'm doing it. And at the moment, I've tried a couple of methods. I wanted to know if there were any better methods, any alternative methods, and I will try them. I'll give them all a chance, and I'll let you know how I get on. Yeah, yeah I, think I, with, I with hope the, you did, Because obviously, um, uh, obviously, Nick and I have been chatting about getting rock room together, obviously with a few others, and obviously, um, I've been chatting to the Oxford guys. Obviously, one of my main concerns is I haven't physically seen the Oxford track for 12 months. It's been in our um, storage room in the place we rent. And obviously, it's just been set up. Uh, we put a dust sheet over it. And there was a, um electrical heater in there to obviously keep any moisture or, or you know, so hopefully um, oxidisation shouldn't be a problem. But yeah. um, obviously, I'm just a bit concerned on, we haven't touched it for 12, 13 months, um, the condition of the rails. Obviously, the only way we can find out. What orientation do you over. stack it, John? In what orientation uh, do you stack it? It's stacked up against, obviously it's on boards up against the wall and it's probably oh. got uh, 80 degrees of angle. No, I, I was wondering if you were stacking individual track pieces because I prefer to no, stack mine like that. Uh, not not I, like that. My Ninko that I've got loose like that, I stack yeah. um, flat in boxes as much as I can. Like um, this? Yes. Okay, so um, when I got my straights out, my straights pile was very, very tall. And a few of the straights at the bottom, I thought, had bowed. And I don't know whether it was because they were bottom or whether just the, the, the bad ones had been rejected. 
they, they do the same on the side as well, Wayne. I store mine on the side. I get exactly the same. Yeah, I get exactly the same issue. Yeah. That was with, with Ninko. I haven't got any scaly sport. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I've got scaly sport because, because I've never had anything else. I've only ever had scale electric classic when I was a child. And that got bent. Thank you. <laughs> You're having a lot of show and tell. Say, say hello, James. Hello. Uh, hello, James. Hello, James. This, these, are, these are the guys that are going to be in the Zoom chatting about mm, 40, 50 years time. <laughs> yep. So these are getting what we got. These are getting, you know, experience like that. Um, yeah, just a quickie for yeah. John Underwood. Uh, we're, we're expecting to start planning up in a month's time, uh, uh, the 17th of May, 19th of May. And yeah. what we plan to do is um, get some cars with old slotted, quite tough braids on and just run those around to, to try and get some continuity in the track. Because mm -hmm. we, we got star feeds out. Each board yeah. has got a, got a feed from the power supply. But to get the, yeah. the braids clean, we're going to put you know quite tough slotted braids out there. I'm not overly concerned, Martin, because I'm taking Alan with me. So um, he's the electrical guy, as you know. So um, as I say, I'm just hoping that we'll plug it together. There may be the odd loose connection. We may have to do a solder or, or two. Um, you know, it's just the, possibly the condition of the rails. So um, as I said to the lads in the, in the email, you know, um, first night, take some cars. But, you know, don't be surprised if you don't get, you know, you may not get any running done. I'm hoping that we will get some, you know, at least one or two lanes running, but hopefully all of them. Yeah, all don't expect um, miracles on the first night. Yeah. You know, whereas at Rockingham, it's a question of turn up, turn the power on and spend 10 minutes cleaning the lanes up, taping them. Because I don't think it was covered up. Was, is it, was the track no. covered, Nick? No, it's all yeah. open. You know, five, 10 minutes, clean the track up. We're up, you know, we'll be back up in the, hopefully in the eights again. You know. <laughs> mine, 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 I just go over it with the old um, clothes rollers and that's it. And that sits up. The only thing I have problems with is a mouse. Did you guys yeah. ever, for, the for, for the Rockingham <laughs> track, the one that's been stored on boards and stuff, did you ever put anything, any antioxidants on the rail WD-40 or inox or anything? Uh, don't think we have, have we, Nick? No, Nick's not the, as far, not as, far as on the way. I wouldn't have thought so. Did anybody um, ever use that on their braids as a braid treatment, or was it disallowed? Or not WD forty. I'm not aware of anyone who uses WD forty. The only thing normally at the, is either a braid conditioner or a bit of um, Zippo. You know, a bit of um, fluid yeah, on your braids. Like you know, like... on the braids. Yeah. Don't worry, um, guys. I'll, I'll pop down with my P six hundred. Yeah. If, 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 any, if anybody, up, I swear to God, if but... anybody wants some of this. Scotch Bright. This is the industrial stuff. Ooh. Now, be aware if you use this, you will need to brush away the fibres that are left behind. But if anybody wants some of this, let me know because I can get it from a very performance orientated source, shall we say. So, it's, it's the old, yeah, I know a guy. Get off the back <laughs> of a truck. So. I, I know a guy. I know a guy. Cover up the name on the shirt. I know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the reason I ask is because once I started using Inox on my track, as a digital racer, it's just the best thing in the world. Uh, but it, it, it meant before I started using Inox, I would use, you know, electrical cleaner and WD-40 and, and all kinds of other things. I never tried ATF, but you know, uh, automatic transmission fluid, but that was popular as well. But every time before, every time I would go out and race on my track, I would have to do that, run the car around for 10 minutes to get it to not stutter the whole way around or clean the rail with something on a rag in you know the, the whole track with something on the rag on each rail. Uh, and then as soon as I used Inox on it, I never had to do that again. Every time I went out, I just put the car on and drove it around it, and it went and never had stuttering problems after that. Never had to do any long, you know, minutes of running the car around to get it to not stutter in places, which is why I always recommend it. If, if somebody's, somebody ever has issues like that and they've never tried it, they should. And anytime you start talking about putting treatment 
of any kind onto rails of a slot car track, the first thing that pops into everybody's head is, well, your cars are going to pick up the oil off the rails and you're not going to have any traction. Well, that just means you put too much on. <laughs> After you put it on, you need to go wipe it up so you don't have any wet on it. It's, it's, it's surprising the, how little you need. So little. A, 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 a single has drop. Any, properly has anyone fixed. used this? This, this is this is a pendle slot racing braid cleaner. Is what is is that different to Inox or is that going to do exactly the same trick? Give it a whiff. Fluid. What's it smell like? I've never done it. <laughs> if it's a cleaner, it's, got... it's probably some kind of solvent. Inox well, isn't, no. Inox isn't a solvent. It's probably no. In it. There you go, Nick. Uh, That's a yeah, dirty smell. Good man. We used to use Palmer. Way to uh, go, teammate. <laughs> It's a dirty smell. It's not. A, it's not a. It's not a uh, chemical or. Obviously, it's a chemical, but it's not well, a. It, I guess is it is it oily or is it? Yeah, it is. I I I have tried it on braid. That, I can't uh, tell the voodoo, difference. The voodoo commentator cleaner. No one. That, no that one's that actually bought stuff. it then. I haven't. It's yeah. it's originally. I'm still know, using the Palmer Targa milk. <laughs> <laughs> is that for tires. <clears throat> Do, do yourself a favor, Martin, and do not put voodoo voodoo commutator cleaner on your comp. No, I, funnily enough, no, I don't. I use it for my braids, um, more to condition the track than anything else. Yeah, yeah it works. I, well I don't put it in a motor. It, it just just eats the comb, doesn't it? Well, it eats the brushes, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, the best thing about, uh, at least for Inox, I've never used voodoo juice or or whatever you guys are talking about. Mm. It, I I pretty much never have to do it. Again, you know, it's it's been done. It's and and now it's done. I don't, I don't have to do it every month or every week or every year or anything like that. Every once in a blue moon, I'll put a brand new car on the track and, you know, doing my little braid twist, it still finds spots on the track that it doesn't go smoothly. So then I'll like, okay, I'll go ahead and put a put a drop on each braid and then, you know, forget about it for the next two years. Until it happens again. Is that only for steel? Does that work on copper as well? It works on pretty much anything. It's it's basically an antioxidant. You know, it's it's like lanolin forty that doesn't evaporate and get gummy. It's it's um it's a lubricant with lan well, it's lanolin, so it, lanolin, it sticks yeah. like sticks like baby shit basically. It sticks it's to a, everything. It sticks really well and it stays on and it. And Is it, it cool again? Where does it's, lanolin come from? Sheep. Sheep wool. Sheep sheep wool. Correct. Sheep wool. Yeah. Sheep wool. <clears throat> yeah, the, so the Aussies you... love it. <laughs> What's it called again, Greg? Inox, I N O X. They make multiple formulations. MX3 is the one that's most popular for using as a rail treatment or a braid conditioner. They also make, uh, I use it for all kinds of, you know, bushings and bearings and stuff as well. It's a very light uh, lubricant oil. They also make a variant, I think it's MX5, that has PTFE. Which, which would be good for bearings and bushings and stuff, but I wouldn't use it as a, tr a rail treatment. Martin's got some. And it, Martin's and, got it. There it is. There you go. Yeah, and you can get a pump spray, which I believe is what Martin had. Uh, you can get it in aerosol form, or you can get it with a needle dropper, which is needle what I Needle dropper, have. yeah. Uh, if, you get a, if you get a pump spray, you can, of course, spray it on, but you don't need that much. You just need like a tiniest little I, I, needle I, drop. So so I, if you get some that's in a bottle that's not got a needle on it, I would get an empty needle bottle and yeah. decant it from whatever yeah. it comes in and yeah, put it into the, the spray needle bottle. You'll waste more than you actually use. Yeah. yeah it, it, it also I've goes got, everywhere. I've still, got, yeah. I've still got four four bottles of the Targa milk left, but that's what I run on mine. And that's going back from the 80s anyway, so that's... <laughs> Hey, I've heard of that stuff. Never, known, never had it. Never known what it was for. Oh yeah, that's the one you were showing off uh, earlier on Facebook, right? Yeah, yeah. And there's the um, new. Nice. So you, you can guess that, where that's it's unusual. Going. Gosh. Yeah, he never does. Oh yeah. Like that. <laughs> but there's no yellow on it. It's just blue. He bigger oh, yellow stickers. <laughs> I give up. <laughs> Yeah, I look forward to seeing that when it's done. Uh, it's well, I say I was I was going to do it today, but I have my granddaughter around. But she, 
she wanted to run her Peppa Pig round, so she was running Peppa Pig round. <laughs> She's got a, a Dodge Charger that's been painted. I think I've shown you it, a uh, picture of it. It's pink. It's got Peppa Pig all over it. It's got a date of birth on it. It's got a name on it. It's got oh, Cushy's awesome. diabetic. It's got all that on it. But she loves it. She was out there today just going bang, 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 bang. I've, put a, I've got a true speed controller, and I've carved a little button out so she can't go flat out. She can only go a certain amount. So the car stays in the slot. But yeah, she's uh because I learned a lesson on me uh on that Nissan, that slotted Nissan. She put it flat out, first corner, and it ended up in the bottom corner in bits. Put the controller down, went, I think I'll go and see Nanny now. <laughs> she knows what's good for her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Doesn't do it to any of her cars though. It's no. always my car. Paul, sure. Paul, that's that's the number one rule of race car driving. Never race your own car. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. I've learned that the old way. She's done three so far. Three cars I've had to re completely rebuild because of it's hit the bottom corner, and she's hit it hard. I mean, so at the end, the end, the end where you come through the driver's bit, you've got a, a chicane, and it goes into a big sweeping curb to go up to the main straight. Well, it's just garage wall there. There's nothing stop. It's, you've got crash barrier and garage wall, and she hit the first corner on the going through the chicane, and it travelled about six foot before it hit the wall. <laughs> and that's where it ended up embedded in the wall. You didn't by chance show her that formula race at Macau, did you? Or? No, no, she she got her own little twist on that. <laughs> I don't think she likes Japanese cars because it's always been the Nissans. It's I've got all I've got the, the, the Nissan and the Toyota. She's just done both Nissans and now done the Toyota. Well, for she heaven's sake, don't show her the brick video. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to. I'm not going to because she'd be going, oh, I'll have some of that. <laughs> yeah. Dad, get oh. a brick. <laughs> yeah. I think I might do that, you know, just put a get a normal house brick and put some wheels on it and see how long it can go. Get a big 124th motor underneath it. It should be fine. I like to see how I try and break that. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that would be great for all the Father Ted fans out there. You guys know it, right? Oh, Martin knows. Okay. The milk float. <laughs> Greek. Yeah, it's a great one. <laughs> or do a Lego one. What's those? Don't Scale Electrics do a Lego one? Oh yeah, build build something. Yeah. Oh, she can she can just smash it to pieces and build it herself. Oh, those deal. are fun. Yeah. I, I, a while ago, I ran a, an IROC race at when the guys were at my track. I put two of those on the track, and you had to. Uh, complete the race with at least one part still attached to the car. <laughs> so, so if they managed to crash and lose all the parts, they had to put the parts back on, but uh, they could bash and crash each other and, uh, until at least one part was <laughs> still uh, with, with, with the kind of detail that Nick put on his GT40, the next step are airbags. Airbags. There you go, Nick. Time to work on those. I'm going to put, wing, put wings on mine. so she can I'll get work it. on it. Leave that Two with wings. me. Uh, all right does anybody got any things they want to share and show i can dig another topic out anybody else got a topic they want to swing around to well, Gra graham was showing some sort of monogram model for a minute and tantalizing us a little bit oh you want to show off something graham no oh okay <laughs> yes <laughs> well at least he's been straightforward to the he's, point. Being <laughs> he's gonna you turn guys... his camera off now you guys, you guys had seen that one before. No, I was just moving things around here on the chair. So. <laughs> Boy, we still got half an hour-ish. I'll dig out a topic. Here we go. Uh, yeah, this will probably take half an hour. So when you are tuning a car for, com for competitive purposes, where, how do you prioritize what you're doing? Let's, let's just assume you have a limited amount of time or a limited amount of money, some limitation. Oh, yes. What are your priorities? So of traction, handling, reliability, power, efficiency, gearing, what tires you start. Grip. Grip. That was grip. Tires. Tire, grip, tire, grip, grip. Oh, grip tires. Tires. Traction, magnets. Where's Alan? Where's Alan Wilcox? Wilkinson. He's the one who always has that 
he has that nice priority list and it's traction, 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 right? Well, that was his idea. You want to you want to pitch in on your own idea first, there, Alan? Is he with us tonight? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, he is. I think. Alan, you're muted. You're talking, but you're muted. There you go. <laughs> there he is. He probably didn't want to listen to me anyway, but yeah, you're you're right. We've talked we've talked through this one before. Always traction, uh, and then handling, and then reliability, and actually performance and power is right at the bottom of the list. But I am starting to do a few crazy things now. I take one of the NSR cars that I uh, I race down at Woodgreen, what and this is um, what do you kind mean of one of the early ones. What do you mean by reliability? Uh, making sure that it gets to the end of the race. Okay. So just making sure that you know everything is as it should be, and everything's put together as it should be. That the grub screws are tight. That you know that you're using the components that will last the distance. I mean, if you're doing sprint races, so what? Three minutes it breaks down. So what? But if you're doing distance racing, you really got to make sure that it, it's going to survive the impact. It's uh, the components are going to last the distance. What kind of is it? Is it, is it the choice of components, or do you use do you use um, you know thread just fine tuning things? Or? You know, I say I, I it's just that. fine tuning. It's things like if you've got a loose um, eyelet, yeah, two choices: get a slightly thicker eyelet. Um, you could possibly bend if you've got enough um, wire, um, double up that, and then poke it in, or a dab of glue. You know. A little bit of super glue or a little bit of um, nail polish, you know, um, just dab it, just stops the thing from rattling out. You know, if you're doing an hour, six hour, 24 hour race, you know, grew, you know, if you could obviously slot it, just on a new um, guide, haven't they, with some grub screws at the front so you can, you can screw your um, brace and your, um, your wires together. So it's just simple things like that, making sure it's lubed properly. Yeah, everything's moving freely. Um, everything's rotating properly, you know, check your gearing, you know, while you're waiting for, you know, final bits of scrutineering, you know, you're five, you know, or we're just, you know, we're just sorting out the, the um, racing order. You've got 10, 15 minutes. If you've got your car there, rip the body off, just double check it, you know, uh, make sure nothing's moved, you know, have, you know, it's just fine details, isn't it? That's all it is. Do you guys ever do anything, do you ever use thread locker on stuff or, um, yeah. Anything like throwing a wire, like you said, a loose eyelet. We we'll throw wires during sprint races, and that's always a pain in the ass because you got to go put the wire back in. I put so the glue is a good idea, but what about what about broken wire? I mean, what kinds of things do you do to prevent just breakage from wear? If your wire breaks, it's normally because it's too tight. It's not um, too short. You haven't got enough play on it. So it, you, you, you con every time it goes around the corner, you're constantly stretching the wire a little bit. Every time the guide turns, the wire's stretching that little bit. Normally, that's the cause for breaking wires. What about that's like one the of the first things? The wire, you know that kind of thing. Yeah, it's one of the first things yeah. I check after a race, Nick. Uh, Greg, is, is I go back and you know, as, as John said, take it apart. Is the pod moving? Is the guide moving? But I always check the guide wires and and the brushes. Because, you know, in my early days, those were two of my biggest failures was uh, either a hat, uh, top hat popping out or, or um, a braid falling out. So I, I take a lot of time looking at it, make sure it's not work hardened around the uh, where it pivots around the, the guide. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you yeah, watch it if it's soldered there as well. If there's any solder on the end of the wire at that point in the, the spot right where the solder finishes, that's where it's going to break. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was put brittle. off soldering. Yeah, I was put off soldering for that very reason because it's, it's a great work hardened mm -hmm. failure point there, isn't it? Yeah, I don't even solder yeah. on the 24 scale cars anymore. On your um, topic of braid, Martin, um, that's probably the thing that I see most when I look at cars at the shop or cars that I see in proxy. Guys will run with braid that shouldn't shouldn't have been used 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Braid's so cheap, if you buy a roll, change the bloody braid. If, if your car, if it's not smooth and flat and thin and clean, that's the first thing that, 
the, the braid sits on the track and everything goes from there. So, um, you know, sp spend 5P and change your braid for God's sake. Yeah, it's very true, Chris. A um, yeah, couple agreed. of English guys, um, there's a chap down in um, London, Julian Edwards, and he's all got a very good saying that, you know, clean braids is worth a tenth of a second. So mm -hmm. he's, he's pretty quick. So it seems to work for him. So, you know. Yeah, there are other things the... besides braids you need to pay attention to. And sometimes through your best efforts, trying to make something more reliable makes it worse. And one of the things I started doing that I thought would be better, but made it worse, was taking components that sit on the axle, for example, um, the collars that sit on the axle, and putting grub screws in both sides instead of just one side. And actually, it didn't, it didn't make it more reliable, because when you've got two grub screws pushing against each other, it only takes one to come loose, and the axle's loose. Yeah, so they both come loose. That's right. So there are so, you know, if, instead of having a situation where if one grub screw comes loose, the axle comes loose, you've got two. And if either of them come loose, the axle comes loose. So there are some things that are counterintuitive. Uh, to tackle that one, I looked at some engineering documents I found online. And large scale engineering, they use multiple grub screws or set screws, but they're not at 180 degrees uh, from each other. Right. Uh, they're, they're always set. Uh, 30 degrees off or something like that and um, slotting plus to a very nice color lightweight color with three grub screws mm -hmm. the points and I found that that what really works for me is if I use two of those yeah. and then you've got two of the grub screws pushing against the axle in a similar direction I've never had one of those come loose yeah. so you know getting your color sort of like light. into a V formation then aren't you yeah you're using the top it. of the axle and you're, you're just locking it with the two um, grubs at the bottom out. Yeah, yeah that, that's exactly that's exactly right. So there are some things where you think, I'll do this and it'll be better, but actually it's worse. But if you look at large scale engineering applications like big machinery, you can find examples and it shows you what you know is done in proper engineering. And those are the things to try and follow. Well, I think, I think most of the, you know, most of the, better racers or the more of experienced racers only use engineering principles like I, there's nothing that um there's nothing that i do on a car or dennis does on a car that doesn't have some sort of engineering foundation or principle to it it's not um you know you, you read on the, the the forums is the is the green for gt40 quicker than the blue one you know and there's some stuff out there that's just mind-boggling, mind-bogglingly. So ready. hold on, you're saying yeah, I mean, no, everybody knows that first, blue cars sorry. are faster than green cars. I, mean, I, I was gonna say, you're, so you're saying my bag of chicken bones doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, but that can actually be true. The green one can be faster than the blue one. Yeah. The red one. Nothing beats a red one though, does it? <laughs> yeah. Red ones are always faster. <laughs> Like, it, it, it literally can be it can be the case because if it's a different production run from a different time period, things well, can yeah. come out different. But that's not the reason why it's faster. <laughs> yeah, if it's different, if it's actually made better in some way. The color isn't the reason. No, I didn't say the color was. I just said that the red one can be better than the green one. Back to your thing on uh, thread locker, Greg. Yes. Um, not so much for club events, but certainly for long-term proxies, depending on the car. Um, I will use thread locker on the wheels, on the gears, uh, especially if um, I'm running an angle winder where the gear mesh is completely um, at the mercy of the, the, the position of the spur gear. Um, all the wheels and all the tires and all the gears on these little things. You don't have to run many laps um, before you notice they do move, they do slide. Yeah. Um, so I will leave the axle a few thou uh, recessed from the boss of any wheel. And when I've got the car set up for a proxy, I'll put a little thread locker into the hub of the wheel so it runs around the end of the axle. And just helps me out. It's a pain to get off at the end, but I'm going to strip the tires off and do that stuff again. So, I mean, back to um, a couple of the other points. To finish first, first you have to finish. So, 
Um, yeah. And it's, you know, I've, I've had lots of races through the years where you learn that valuable lesson. So, um, you know, everything on the car needs to be, I don't think there's just one thing. I think it's all things. Um, you know, just because you have a lot of traction, if your front end's not set properly or the guide's not, you know, I mean, you can have a lot of traction and the car can bounce out of the slot every five feet. Um, yeah. You know, it can handle great, but it goes backwards. Like, it, 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 I mean, it's just, you need to put together a complete car. Or it flies. Hmm. So thread locker, obviously not a bad idea for things that need to not vibrate their way loose. And that makes perfect sense. Depending on what you're doing. And there are <clears throat> yeah, if it's long term, if it's long, if it's something that you've, you've adjusted and you want to stay there, thread lock's yeah. great. The it's trouble is with most threads is you need to adjust it or it's, you just take a component off. Um, yeah. So the only thing I would use thread lock on uh, with what I race is obviously um, possibly suspension units. I'm talking of a six hour or 24 hour, you know, some of the um, suspension units aren't brilliant. So, a little bit of same thing, thread lock, a bit of dab of super glue, a bit of um, nail polish on them. Um, I think we've got a couple of bits of thread lock on our specialist um, Toyota chassis yeah. that we got from uh, Nick DeWatcher from Germany. I think that's got some oh, yeah. certain bits. Obviously, once it's you've adjusted it, you want it to stay there. So I think Matt's just put some thread lock on that. But most of the time, you want to take it off. So why make the job harder? If you use thread lock, and this is what I was going to say earlier, I'll see if I can see that. But that's an NSR suspension piece mm. in my right hand here, and this is a regular thread lock that you can use. But this is a thread lock that's really designed for metal to metal contact. And if you allow that thread lock to come into contact with the plastic, you may find that it erodes and melts the plastic. And uh, this was one of those situations where I had a failure and I, thought, I didn't understand why the suspension fall apart because I did put thread lock on it. But again, it's one of those cases where you think you're going to do something that's going to make the thing better, but actually it made it worse. So thread lock I'll use on metal to metal components. But for things like the NSR suspension caps, if they're loose, I will buy new ones. You know, that's the that's the approach I go. Short term fix for those is you just put a little bit of um, clear nail varnish or anything. But like you say, ultimately you will need to re replace them. Right. But if if it goes halfway through a race and you haven't got a spare, just a little bit of nail varnish. All right, it'll take five minutes to go off. Mm -hmm. At least you'll in be my back experience. In the race. In my experience, the most typical place for this to occur is the plastic threads, typically in a body post, because you're taking the body shell on and off. And uh, I, I often use just a just just a tiniest bit of CA, thin CA, onto a pin and put the pin in the body tube and just spin it around in there, take it out, and leave it to dry, and then you'll that will naturally tighten up. Next time you put the uh, self tapper screw in, it'll go squeak, 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 and that and that'll just have a new It'll, it'll last for months, let's put it that way. Several reasons. You raise a good point there, Wayne. What are people's uh, views on the screws for, bo for body mounts? Do you, do you go for a coarse pitch, which would seem more sensible than a fine pitch? I stick with the OEM one because there's a thread in there already for that. Although I've got no problem with... I've got no problem with fitting aftermarket screws... I just don't like spending on aftermarket screws if I can get the original ones to float nicely. That's a fair point. The trouble is, Wayne, is that most of the screws that you get don't have, um, they're not half shank screws, are they? So That's correct. The half shank screw is a very nice thing to have with that little bit of plain unthreaded area that sits in the yeah. hole. And yeah, I, well, I can, I've you know, actually I, I manufactured that. Around, yeah. I, I, I was looking the other day, I think I'm just coming up to my sort of 20th year of um, racing and sort of thinking about, you know, sort of screws. I've got screws from everyone, mate. You name it, you know, all the Spanish sites, the Italian sites, are from the bloody same anyway. But um, mm -hmm. sometimes it's always handy to have a cut of different um, sizes of screw, Wayne. You know, yes. Buy a packet of slotted um, 
brass metric screws, buy a packet of NSR, buy a, you know, slotting plus. There's plenty yeah. of manufacturers out there that sell screws. Have a collection in your pit box, just in case. Do you know what? I've been looking all over AliExpress for screw manufacturers that make M2, M2.5, M2.2, M1.6 um, uh, threaded screws with plain shanks, and I can't find any anywhere. Yeah, they're like rocking or stroppings, mate. They are. They, they, only, they only mean seem to make them for the, the slot reason, manufacturers. The, the reason for that is the they are made. They are made by NSR. NSR make those yeah. screws in the yes. factory. Oh, exactly. And, uh, and they do that. And that's that's kind of the that's the heritage and the origin of NSR that their first foray into slot manufacture was to, to create retrofit gears for Ninko cars, things like that. Yeah. But those are, you know, mm -hmm. those are the thing. And and as yeah. as uh, John said, get different ones because they are different. Um well, the NSR screws, funny. thread is cut. The thread is cut into the the screw, whereas the mm. the slotted ones, it's either rolled or the shank is cut deeper. So it's actually a slightly yeah. different thread and it sits more proud. So you need different screws for different purposes. Yeah, have a nice little bag full of screws. It's a good idea. Well, if you remember, Alan, a few years ago, when we were at, uh, at um, Rockingham, you were having problems. I think you were running a NSR Corvette and you were having problems with your suspension. I said, I'll oh, put some longer springs in them. Oh, I haven't got any. So I fished in my box and gave you a couple of longer screws. And I think you were back up and running again, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's good, you know. I think that's one of the things I enjoy about slot racing is that, you know, the, everybody's willing to share, you know, parts and help, especially for people yeah. who clearly don't know what they're doing. And clearly our team didn't know what we were doing back then. <laughs> so, not that we do now. I still don't know what I'm doing, scale. Alan. I the just turn up racing. second mate. scale racing is it's a lot like one-to-one -one scale racing. If someone says, have you got, and you have, you, you do the favour because you'll never know when you need a favour in return. Yeah. Who's that? Box of screws? Right. Yeah, I just wanted to talk to you guys. I've just ordered today, funnily enough. A whole batch of screws and, and, and nuts from China. I get all of my stuff. So I've ordered two, 2.5, 2 2.8, 3, and 4. Um, and they cost next to nothing. I think I, I spent $20 and I'm getting about 500 right. Now, this is another one that I got. This is all, it says 1 to 1 1.8. And I'll bet it was free shipping size. as well from China. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and it's, uh, <laughs> it, to me, that's, that's what I buy, and I, I these little boxes go around with me everywhere. So, can, can you stick the link on there, Anthony? Space. Sorry, can you stick a link. Can you stick a link on the chat for where you source um, these things from? And I, I never quite know what to ask for. Um, this I got off Wish. Well, plenty loose. Okay, and the, all the stuff I ordered today I got off eBay. Um, how do I get hold of you off off site here, and I can send you a link? I'll it's stick my uh, I'll stick my forum name in the chat now, Anthony. Okay. I'll send you a PM on, on the forum. Okay. Which forum? Uh. <laughs> Your uh, one. Your one. Okay. I'll go <laughs> on to SFI and I'll pick it up. Look it up. Look me up. You know who I am. AB321. Okay. Oh, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just we won't go into details, but I'm kind of semi persona non grata there. So. Uh, it's it's not oh that guy. It's oh that guy again. <laughs> <laughs> oh look, he's back. <laughs> we've oh, only got a few more minutes. Does anybody want to circle back on anything? Touch touch back. Add to the discussion on pr tuning priorities. Yeah, I, um, I get some of my stuff from my, my father's gone in. He used to be into slot racing. He's gone into the model railway side. So the model railways, you can get fat, quite good quality screws and bits from that side and springs, especially on the buffers. They've got very, very light springs on them and they're brilliant for suspensions. Yep. Mm. I was going to show you my slotting plus box. Show us your slotting plus box. Yeah, that's it. Full of M2 hardware. Where is it? There we go. 
Wayne, did you? Dick Van Dyke just turned up there. Did you? Uh, Wayne? I, yeah, I went to shove the little one back up the chimney. Called blimey, Mary Poppins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. Oh, bless awesome. you, Gav. Don't you drop that. No, it's not. They've all got. They've all got little, little legs. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Little legs. Look at this. Yeah, oh, that's, nice. know, that's a that's a pillbox, isn't it? Yeah. It, it, it could be. Yeah. yeah. You've been to your local dealer again, haven't you? <laughs> oh, I'm not. That's nice. All my little nylon washers and yeah, shims. Nice. Does it say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. Thursday on them? <laughs> hey, look. Viagra, 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 Viagra. You, you want a grub screw? How long do you want it? Two mil, three mil, five mil, ten mil? Tramadol. It's yeah, we away. actually, Wayne, we we we've all That's, and, and like club, we've got all our gears in those. Have you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Steve Steve Jones very kindly um, labelled them all up. You know, twenty seven angle winder, twenty seven inline, and I've still got an empty one. I've got more gears than that though. <laughs> At the <laughs> moment, it's it's all my hardware. It's all my screws except the self tappers, which you know, which come out of the cars. All that is metric metric M two, and that's what I've converted a lot of my. I just advocated using the OEM screw, but I'm using a lot of M2. <laughs> <laughs> oh, enough. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad everything's going well with the OCD. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? They're not even Phillips head. They're Torx. Yeah, wow. I love it. I love the little, the positive, uh, you know, I've got a little wearer Torx driver. I'm just trying to fill the last few minutes for you. <laughs> and, you're doing uh, a grand job, Wayne. You're doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just waiting for the little boy to come flying out the chimney again. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I, I was going to ask, can you make those little things burp? <laughs> Speaking of the container, you said you got this. This is a bunch of. You said slotting plus at first. Was that like a, a, a whole bunch of screws or was it the container? No, got, no. You you can buy this container from slotting plus. It's uh, oh. I didn't know that until I was browsing the slotting plus website one day after having bought this container. <laughs> so it's just an OEA. It's just a container that's just out there somewhere. It's I, I one, need... Yeah, one pound 25 in lo class lo also. Local fishing tackle but, shop. Marketing. As, as Mark and I will tell you, it's called marketing. Yes, yes, it is. It's wanketeering. <laughs> it's whatever the market will bear. Yeah, market wank. I love, you know, Wayne, one... I, I love that it's the, I mean, you can, you can get any number of those, you know, row containers with separate lids and all, but I love how it's several of those in a larger container. I've not yeah, seen that yeah. before. So that's pretty cool. It's yeah, designed for the surgery. It's, it's the bigger container holding a lot, whole lot of them. It's, I it's saw something for like that. The family. family. <laughs> they're, they're, they're tiny, tiny little boxes. What have I got? Four times. Guess what? Seven. It is a pill box, isn't it? Seven days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a and travel. Week, Wednesday. Uh, yeah, but whoever counted that. The dates off. <laughs> whoever counted that and saw Wait, seven. It's, it's made for cruises, man. I never even knew it made yeah, for a cruise. <laughs> made for a holiday. That's a month's worth there you got, mate. Exactly. You're right. Yeah. If it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just don't don't mix it up with the Viagra ones. Blue ones. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. all, all of a sudden grand, granddad can't get on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> How do I screw the lid back down? <laughs> Why won't he stand up, Mom? <laughs> kind of a bit too much screwing going on here. <laughs> and that's with a hex screw as well. Yeah. Torx. Uh, Torx. 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 And if you like, if you like, you, you, if you want quality inexpensive, uh, they're the wearer brand. I I really like the wearer brand. Yeah. You could be a commercial wine. Yeah. yeah. Wayne, where did you buy your... Not sponsored. What are you flogging? <laughs> what are you flogging? No, I went, just went to the interweb. You can you can pay a lot of money for this, for this, but you can also get it. There's a lot of places you can get them for... There's yeah, a Petru Petrucci. Of How much Petrucci, do you pay for your one? They're about How three pound on, on eBay. I think... I don't. I don't remember. I didn't get them on eBay. I think they're six, seven pound a piece on eBay. They're not. They're not. It's not the cheapest place I found. I, I've beaten eBay. Yeah, uh, I've bought, bought them for about three or four quid off of eBay. Or yeah, yeah but, but I reckon it's the cheapest. 
one of those RS components. You know, yeah, get. four pound. Do yeah. you need a? Do you need a? Do you need a? Um, do you need an account to be able to use them, or no. can you use them as a? Okay. Well, you need a, some sort of bank card. Yeah. I think I be, <laughs> honestly, I think <laughs> I beat that. Yeah. RS components is just across the road from Rockingham Club, isn't it? Yeah. 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 The other side of the roundabout. I bought this one. from RS components. Is it? Oh, I need to go. I can smell my deodorant being sprayed around by my four-year-old, seven-year-old. <laughs> oh, we're at the top of the second hour. <laughs> He's Thanks sniffing it. <laughs> I know the drivers there, Petrucci. We're now at the end of our two hours. Okay. So I'm going to stop the recording. You guys can keep chatting. I'm going to grab some lunch. Until next time, everybody say bye. 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 bye.